Well, happy Friday, Colorado. Today is March 24th, 2023. This is your weekly news roundup from freestatecolorado.com. So pour yourself a cup of coffee and let's take a look at some of the news stories of the week. I wanted to start off with some good news this week from the Colorado Sun.com, March 16th, 2023. Colorado lawmakers reject proposal to ban horse slaughter for human consumption. So this is good news. Unfortunately, there's a lot of anti-agricultural activists in our state government, a lot of anti-ranching politicians and politicos around our state. So thankfully, this bill was stopped. Originally, originally the original version of this bill would have made it a crime to slaughter horses and burros for human consumption, but it was amended to instead establish tighter regulations when transporting 20 or more horses for slaughter. So thankfully here, the Senate voted 20 to 14 to kill the proposal, siding with ranchers and livestock groups who said the legislation was unnecessary and could lead to more horses dying inhumanely of sickness and old age. So let's hope this is a good sign that the state lawmakers are going to be more open to protecting our ranching community. And we'll see what happens here. But just wanted to share some good news. Start off with there. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This is from OutThereColorado.com. March 15th, 2023, human waste, 633 pounds of propane, two tons of trash found in Denver encampment. So as we saw last week, you know, the homelessness issue has been one of the, the top issues for Colorado, especially Denver voters during this election cycle here in 2023 with the Denver City Council and Denver Mayor up for grabs. According to a social media post, from Denver Mayor Michael B. Hancock, a large-scale cleanup effort took place at the local encampment that posed significant health and safety risks. Violence had recently occurred at the encampment, with at least one individual sustaining gunshot wounds. Three people in the encampment accepted services from the city, while the rest were required to leave the area so that hazards could be mitigated. Here we go. In addition to 633 pounds of propane, two tons of trash, numerous discarded needles and human waste found at the site, there were also a number of fire hazards in the vicinity. Not only had several light poles been illegally tapped for electricity, something that could spark a fire or cause an explosion, there was also a gas leak in a nearby building and evidence of burning in the general area. This is your state of Denver, folks. Unfortunately, this is what's going on in our capital city here in Colorado. The homelessness issue continues to be a major issue, and I hate harping on it every week, but it's something that can't be ignored. Unfortunately, so many of these people who are out there living on the streets are just ignored by the rest of society. So it is something that needs to be addressed one way or another. We'll see how this shakes out during the Denver election coming up on April 4th. Very curious about how that's going to play out. Moving on. Some other good news here from Fox 31, KDVR.com. This is from March 16th, 2023. Bill would reduce money agencies get from seized assets. A new bill would touch tens of millions in civil asset forfeiture revenue for police attorneys in cities. Under Colorado law, law enforcement, district attorneys, cities, and other agencies are allowed to seize property suspected of being linked to a crime. This is a civil action separate from the criminal prosecution. The agencies can take the assets whether or not the owner is found guilty of the crime. Civil asset forfeiture is a totally an assault against our private property rights. It's an attack on the dignity of the individual, and there's no end to the stories where state law enforcement across the country has stolen money and the assets of individuals who have not been convicted of a crime. So it's great to see this bill going through the state legislature. Recently, legal movements in some U.S. cities and states have attempted to put more oversight on civil asset forfeiture or abolish it entirely. Colorado is one of these states. House Bill 23, 1086, titled the Due Process Asset Forfeiture Act, would allow agencies to seize assets only if defendants are found guilty of a crime. Sponsored by Colorado Representative Ken DeGraff. Ken DeGraff is one of our liberty leaders in the state legislature, an El Paso County Republican. It would also link the seizure to a criminal case rather than creating a separate civil case. Wow. So as you can see here, the amount of money that the state government uh, has stolen from, and maybe not just the state, but the state and local governments have stolen from individuals who have not been convicted of a crime over the years is absolutely astronomical. I mean, this is 16 million in 2022, 20 million in 21, 26 million in 2020, and 12 million in 2019. Wow. 
All told, Colorado has seized just over $75 million in value from civil asset forfeitures. Absolutely crazy. Here's what's been kept. So in 2022, nearly $4 million was kept by the government um, through civil asset forfeiture. So great to see. Kudos to Ken DeGraff, one of our liberty leaders down at the state capitol. Somebody who's actually fighting for our freedoms and wish him all the luck. Hopefully we see some civil asset forfeiture reform here in Colorado. It'd be great to see the process actually abolished. So we'll keep an eye on this bill and hope we hope it passes. Let's go ahead and move on. Independenceinstitute.org, I2I.org, March 16th, 2023. Colorado policymakers looking to crack down on oil and gas industry once again. This is from Jake Fogelman. Colorado, regu- Colorado lawmakers and regulators are set to turn their attention back toward a familiar target, the state's oil and gas industry. On Thursday, Governor Jared Polis announced that he was directing regulators at the Colorado Oil and Gas Commission, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and the Air Quality Control Commission, gosh, you think there's enough of these organizations, to begin crafting new regulations to crack down on nitrogen oxides and other pollutants in a push to slash oil and gas emissions by at least 30% in the next two years and at least 50% by 2030. Wow. This is an anti-energy governor we have a very radical administration trying to basically destroy Colorado's oil and gas industry. We'll spare you the words of Jared Polis and what he says. Moving on to what Fogelman continues here. The impetus for the sudden renewed interest in cracking down on oil and gas comes from the EPA's recent downgrade of the Northern Front Range non-attainment area's ozone status and a general perception that caught the COGCC hasn't quite been draconian enough in its interpretation of 2019's SB 181. Per the Colorado Sun, legislators, front range elected officials, and environmental nonprofits are frustrated at what they say is the regulators' failure to carry out provisions of a 2019 law requiring drilling permitting to be based on human health impacts rather than just economic benefit to the state. Wow. So, Keep an eye on this, people. Oil and gas is a big industry, employs a lot of people, and of course, it's what keeps the lights on, keeps our homes heated, keeps our homes cooled all year round. So the fact that our state legislators are ramping up their attacks on the oil and gas industry is something that should be very concerning. I mean, most Coloradans right now are seeing record high utility bills. Imagine what's going to happen as oil and gas industry gets more and more control over it, more regulation, gets shut down. I mean, shutting down 50%. Of our carbon, of all of our emissions over the next couple of years is not going to be a, a a good place to live because people won't be able to drive, people won't be able to heat their homes. I mean, this is the future the Democrats want. But let's move on. Let's see what else is going on in Colorado this week. This is about a bill going on at the state legislature currently. Another example of how economically ignorant a lot of these legislators are. This is from LawWeekColorado.com. New Gig Worker Act may raise prices, reduce earnings, and damage competition. March 16th, 2023. By Jennifer Harple and Michael Lotito. Last month, Colorado lawmakers introduced the Gig Worker Transparency Act, a law regulating app-based companies. The law would make the companies disclose certain information about transactions on their apps including the amount workers make for each ride or order, the amount a consumer pays, the amount charged to a retailer, like a restaurant or grocery store, and the amount the app-based company keeps for itself. Lawmakers say they want this information to be public because it will help make sure workers, consumers, and retailers are treated fairly. The law may cause consumers to pay more and workers to make less. Of course, I mean, any government intervention in the economy is going to cause that to happen. Consumers paying more, workers to make less. I mean, this is absolutely ridiculous. Why not do this in every single business across the state then? You know, some of these legislators probably want that. It is so dumb. In 2020, a Harvard Business School study looked at the effect of pay transparency in private sector employment. It concluded that on average, the laws tended to reduce pay by about 2%. Another study from the National Bureau of Economic Research found that the public, in the public sector, pay transparency drove down compensation by 7%. Kind of makes sense, right? Because uh, as the article continues, pay rates are public, then you know c- uh, companies are going to be a little more reluctant to give higher pay. They're going to err on the side of caution and just have less pay for everybody, right? Makes a lot of sense. 
So, of course, this bill is backed by the labor unions, AFL-CIO, Service Employees International Union, and the Teamsters. These organizations do not necessarily have the best interests of Colorado at heart. So we'll hopefully see this gig worker bill, bill fail. Gig working economy has really been helpful to a lot of people, especially a lot of lower income individuals. We're looking for that extra money, you know, working some extra time on their on their time off, their days off, to bring in a little bit extra money for their families, delivering food or driving people around town. I mean, it's a great service to the community and it's a great way for them to make additional money. The government getting involved in these industries is only going to create problems. Let's move on. ColoradoPolitics.com Selling alcohol to drunk driver, not enough to hold liquor store liable for deaths, court says. This is from March 17th, 2023, updated March 20th, 2023, from Michael Karlick over at ColoradoPolitics.com. The Court of Appeals ruled that the alcohol sold must be the cause of the accident. So I think this is some good news. I don't think it's up to these liquor stores or cashiers at a liquor store or even now grocery store or gas station to be responsible for somebody who drinks that alcohol and then causes causes somebody to die. So businesses are not liable for injuries caused by a drunk driver if they sold alcohol to the already intoxicated motorist. But the person did not consume it before causing the accident. Colorado's second highest court ruled last month. Seems pretty straightforward. A three-judge panel for the Court of Appeals answered a question never addressed before. Whether the state's Dram Shop Act requires a, ca a causal link between the alcohol sold to a driver and the injuries that driver later inflicts on others. Under the plain language of the statute, Road Judge Joanne L. Vogt, a vendor's civil liability requires a showing that the intoxication of the person causing injury was due to the sale of any alcohol beverage to the person. Consequently, Breckenridge Market and Liquor is not liable for the deaths of two people in 2019, killed by Lindsay Ward shortly after she left the store with her alcohol purchase. Ward had been hitting golf balls on August 30th, 2019, and consumed several alcoholic drinks at the golf course. She then drove to a market and bought a 12-pack of beer and a bottle of tequila. Market employees asked the clearly drunk Ward if she was all right to drive and even offered to give Ward a ride home. She declined, purchased the alcohol, and drove off. Minutes later, she crashed into another car, killing Benjamin Mitten and Nicole Gao. A police report indicated Ward's blood alcohol content was twice the legal limit. Ward received a sentence of 16 years for the deaths of Mitten and Gog. And two store employees were also convicted of misdemeanors for serving alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person. Before crashing, Ward never consumed what she brought from the market. Family members of Mitten and Goo sued Ward, the golf course, and the market, ultimately reaching settlements with everyone but the liquor store. The plaintiffs allege the market violated the Dram Shop Act, which allows for civil lawsuits against alcohol vendors when they serve a visibly intoxicated customer and the drunkenness is the cause of some injury. The parties disputed, however, whether the mere fact of selling the alcohol can render a business liable or if the alcohol sold has also to be a factor in the drunk driving accident. So pretty straightforward. Um, good to see that this was clarified in the courts. But, you know, liquor stores, hey, if they sell the alcohol to somebody who's drunk, if the, that alcohol itself is not the cause of the accident, I don't think they should be held liable. So kind of an interesting court case. But let's move on, see what else is going on in the state this week. This is from the Gazette.com, Gazette Editorial Board, March 19th, 2023, Wrecking Colorado's Rental Market. You'd think a legislator so committed to tenants' rights wouldn't try so hard to run Colorado's landlords out of business, particularly in a state whose major population centers already face a dire shortage of affordable rental housing. After all, landlords and ten tenants actually need one another. A simple equation policymakers seem to overlook these days in one misguided proposal after another. Whether more radical and economically obvious, like rent control, or incremental, like further restricting landlords' ability to evict over unpaid rent, the cumulative effect is to make it even more prohibitive to build, own, or manage rental housing. Meaning, there will be less and less rental housing to go around, and it will be progressively harder for Colorado's growing population to find a place to live and per another economic reality that often eludes the would-be reformers, rents will rise even higher. 
Exactly. The Gazette hit the nail on the head with this. What we're seeing in Colorado, all of these tenants' right bills, eviction bills, rental bills, these attacks on property owners, on landlords are going to hurt renters. Renters are going to have a lot harder time finding places to rent because people don't want to rent property out. You create the market, you make the market too restrictive, you make it difficult for people to rent. What do you think is going to happen? I mean, simple basic economics. And the lower supply will, with a high demand, will lead to higher prices. And if prices are capped by the government, well, you're going to have shortages at that point. I mean, it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. I think the Gazette editorial board gives the, some of our state legislators too much credit here. I mean, the simple fact is we do have some Democratic socialists serving in our state legislature. And, you know, they might want to see the entire private housing economy collapse because they have some utopian fantasy a garbage fantasy thinking that they can somehow create state housing for everybody everybody around i mean gazette uh don't give these people too much credit some of them are actual communists some of them actually want to see government housing overtake the private rental market nonetheless this is a great article it's a lot of good examples of how the state government is causing more problems and more trouble for renters and property owners across the state so it's something we need to watch uh, of course the free market is the solution Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. This is an interview I put out this week from freestatecolorado.com uh, with the wonderful Liberty leader, Sue Moore. I really had a great time talking to her. Sue Moore is the chairman of the Colorado Liberty Republicans who put out the Liberty Scorecard. It is a great, great rating system for our state legislators to hold them accountable to say, hey, are they following what they should be? What are they doing at the state capitol? You know, so few people know what's, what their legislators are doing, how they're representing the community and what bills they're voting for. So Liberty Scorecard Colorado rates all the bills every year, including the legislators themselves under these principles, individual rights, free markets, and limited government. So check out this interview if you're interested. Uh, support Liberty Scorecard. Donate to their organization. They do a wonderful job. LibertyScorecardCO.us is the place you want to be. But check out my interview with Sue Moore on FreeStateColorado.com. Let's move on. See what else is going on here this week. I thought this was really interesting. Uh, it's kind of an interesting contrast to see how Wyoming and Colorado are going their separate ways on the abortion issue. Obviously not the only issue that is a clear distinction between the two states, but to see here uh, how Wyoming is going to affect what happens here in Colorado, I always find that very interesting. So new law puts Wyoming at forefront of abo abortion pill bans. This is from Mead Groover, March 21st, 2023, an APnews.com article. Shy Ann, Wyoming. Wyoming has pushed to the front of state efforts to prohibit the most common type of abortion by instituting the nation's first explicit ban on pills that terminate pregnancies. Medication abortions, which usually involve taking two prescription medications days apart or at home or in a clinic, became the preferred method for ending pregnancy in the U.S. even before the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and now account for more than half of all abortions, according to the Guttmacher Institute, a research group that supports abortion rights. More than a dozen states have responded to the Supreme Court's ruling by effectively banning abortion pills through prohibitions on all forms of abortion. Very, very interesting. So it'll be interesting to see how abortion uh, in, in Wyoming is becoming illegal. And what that'll do here in Colorado, as we, there was another article this week I did not share about Colorado becoming a hub for out-of-state abortions, that half the abortions that happen in Colorado are from people out of state. Absolutely tragic, really sad situation. But I think we're going to see more of this as Wyoming and other conservative states uh, get strict on abortion. Unfortunately, this will also mean that some of these radical types are going to move to Colorado and try and influence our government here. But something to be aware of, something to watch. I also think that Wyoming is very smart to do this for political reasons. Uh, regardless of the abortion issue, the idea that the Wyoming is using their their government and their political power to to protect the Republican majority is very smart. I'd love to see Colorado Springs, El Paso County, Weld County, any rural community in Colorado do similar efforts to cement their control and make sure that Democrat voters don't move there. So very interesting. Uh, wanted to talk about that a lot for that reason alone. But let's move on to the next article here. From the great Complete Colorado, page two. Page2.completecolorado.com. 
draft open records bill favors journalists over the public. News media defined by the legislature. Wow. March 21st, 2023, Sherry Fife. A legislative bill still in draft form would codify a state government definition of who is a journalist, as well as differentiate both waiting times and the cost of public records requests under Colorado's open records law for those who don't meet its definition. While the intent is to make public records more affordable and easier to obtain for some, the bill's current language also gives government more control over who can play watchdog making it costlier and more cumbersome for average citizens to get information on their elected officials than for those who would fall under the definition of news media. The draft bill is sponsored by Democrats Chris Hansen in the Senate. Chris Hansen has no shortage of bad ideas. And Mark Snyder in the House, another uh, <laughs> another bad one. Senator Hansen is also a candidate for mayor in the forthcoming Denver municipal election. The bill defines news media in basic terms as either a broadcast entity that is licensed by the Federal Communications Commission or as a publication that has published one or more regular editions in each of the four calendar quarters preceding the request for public records. Wow. Then there's other restrictions, other other controls over what a news media organization is in the state. I mean, absolutely and utterly insane. Just a perfect example of how the legislature, how politicians in general think they're doing the the public a favor, but actually end up creating a situation that causes more problems. You know, I mean, Colorado Open Record Act core requests are very important for citizens to understand what's happening inside the state government. It's a great tool for individuals, you know, individuals like me, other citizen journalists, you can say, who want to get get information out to the public and see what's actually happening behind closed doors. Well, of course, the state government wants to make it harder for individuals to do that, whether they say that's the intention or not, um, under the guise of helping news media organizations. And we all know whose side the news media organizations are. There's a reason that half the American population does not trust corporate news media. It's totally agenda-driven, especially here in Colorado, especially when you consider organizations like Nine News and others who are clearly defined by political ideology rather than trying to be an unbiased, impartial source of information for the public. So very strange times we're in. Um, Reminds me of some other bills we've seen about regulating social media companies and media organizations in general. Let's hope this fails, and let's hope Chris Hansen and Mark Snyder get get some criticism over this. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the next one here. I want to share an event coming up, but coming up Wednesday, March 29th, 2023 in Denver, actually at the Independence Institute on 727 East 16th, East 16th Avenue, excuse me, deconstructing ESG with Clint Russell from Liberty Lockdown. ESG or environmental social governance has been slowly infecting all levels of business and culture, but your average person has likely never even heard of it. It largely aims to force politics and woke ideas into business in place of the profit motive. Clint Russell of the Liberty Lockdown podcast is coming by to break down ESG and why we all should be deeply concerned about this idea that many consider a Trojan horse. We will be meeting at the Independence Institute. We are starting the event an hour late. Doors open at 7, talk starts at 8, drinks will be provided. Anyone is welcome to bring their own food or food to share. Definitely want to check this out. Clint Russell is an expert on ESG. ESG stands for Environment Social Governance. Basically, this whole idea that corporations should exist to fulfill some sort of social social needs based on the environment and being socially responsible as opposed to trying to be profitable. Well, if you understand economics, you understand that profit is rewarded to entrepreneurs and businesses who meet the needs of the community. You know, people give money because their needs are being satisfied. They get a product they want or a service that they need. So this is going to be a great talk. Liberty on the Rocks is the best Liberty meetup in the state of Colorado. Something you definitely want to check out. So Wednesday, March 29th, 2023. Hope to see you there. We'll go ahead and move on to an article I put out this week on freestatecolorado.com. Colorado's political establishment exposed. New era Colorado. 
So this is a series I started uh, going through some of the different organizations behind the scenes. Who's pulling the strings in Colorado? You know, that's really the question. Um, how do Democrats take Colorado? Who's really behind a lot of this agenda that we're seeing happen through our state legislature and, and in counties and municipalities across the state? It's n there's not a lot of people involved, actually, in Colorado politics, if you really break it down to the core level. And it's very interesting to see who are some of these power players and how. How have they actually been able to gain power in our state and influence our our lives so this article breaks down uh, a group called new era colorado familiar to many people in the know however i think people need to know about them it was started by these four four people here recent cu student graduates steve fenberg uh, is currently the senate president jonah goose is our congressman from cd2 leslie harrod a state representative who's running for denver mayor lisa kaufman longtime chief of staff for jared polis both in congress and in the colorado governor's office so it's very interesting to see some of the most politically powerful and connected people currently the most politically uh, connected and powerful people how they started out in 2006 with this organization how it's grown to be to be a multi-million dollar organization and how they're working to to influence colorado politics so definitely check it out um you know, I think the liberty community, people who believe in freedom, property rights, individualism, need to learn from these authoritarian leftists and see how they were able to do what they did so that we can, you know, replicate their success and, and do it better. So check that out. FreeStateColorado.com. Moving on. March 20th, 2023, CBSNews.com. Lawmaker says Colorado will receive windfall from Marshall Fire if use taxes aren't waived. Of course, taxes are really debilitating to the community, people who've lost their homes in the fires here. So state lawmakers are considering a bill to waive or refund millions of dollars in taxes for people impacted by certain wildfires, including the Marshall Fire. Right now, the state RTD and the Scientific and Cultural Facilities District charge sales and use taxes of 4% on building materials. Superior, Louisville, and Boulder County waived their sales and use taxes on fire rebuilds, and over the last year, Marshall Fire survivors have begged state lawmakers to do the same, saying it's money the state never budgeted for and wouldn't receive if not for a massive wildfire. Deborah Fahey is one of those who testified in favor of the bill. The house that my husband and I lost, we built in 1990. Fahey, Fahey is mayor pro tem of Louisville and lost her whole neighborhood in the fire. Moving on here, a bill fired by state reps Judy Amabile and Kyle Brown would waive or refund the taxes not only on homes impacted by Marshall Fire, but any declared wildfire disaster between 2020 and 2025. The state is actually looking for a windfall in terms of taxes after one of these declared disasters, Amabile told the committee. That doesn't seem right to the people that are suffering, but some committee members wondered where to draw the line. State Rep. Anthony Harstuk asked, how do we differentiate between them and, let's just say, the Black Forest Fire or anything that we're going to have in the future? It seems like we're picking winners and losers here. <laughs> Interesting. So great use of language there, picking winners and losers, kind of a, a liberty talking point um, to go after people who want to save taxes for, for victims of the Marshall Fire. I think it's a good bill. I hope this bill gets passed. If any legislator, any state representative or senator does not support <laughs> lowering costs for martial fire victims. I think they need to be held accountable. So another article from Sean Boyd here, a good one. We will keep an eye on this bill as it goes through the state legislature. Let's move on. A couple more articles here. We got KDVR.com, Fox 31. Which DPS board members voted to remove school resource officers in 2020? March 22nd, 2023. So as you know, I'm sure uh, there's a horrible uh, string of shootings, really, but one just recently in Denver East High School. And of course, in 2020, Denver Public Schools Board unanimously voted to remove student resource officers from campuses, thus ending the district's contract with the Denver Police Department. All SRO positions were eliminated by June 2021. So these school board members... I mean, East High School is a, is not the safest high school in the state, as we've seen this year. And having a law, uh, an armed law enforcement there could potentially do some good. But of course, we have Tay Anderson, Jennifer Bacon, Scott Balderman, Angela Cobain, Reverend Brad D. Luverick, and Barbara O'Brien, and Carrie Olson, who all voted to remove 
armed police officers from Denver Public Schools. Now, following Wednesday's shooting at East High, Denver Police Chief Ron Thomas told parents that officers would return to campus. The two armed police officers will be present at the high school for the remainder of the school year. So the superintendent knows that this potentially violates the policy. Of course, now the school board rep- says it supports the decision, but very interesting to see how now it's backfired on the Denver school board. I mean, DPS board members, all these names we just saw, really need to be held accountable. Not that they're responsible, obviously, for a crime being committed, but at the same time, not recognizing the fact that armed good guys are the only thing they're going to stop armed bad guys. I mean, taking these armed police officers out of the schools creates a soft target, creates a situation in which criminals like this this guy over here can come into the school with a firearm. No fear. No fear that they're going to be shot at. No fear that anybody there's going to be armed. That's the situation they've created. This is what happens when you ban guns. You create situations in which bad guys have an advantage over the good guys. That is the simple cut dry case of what we're seeing here happen. All of these legislators are trying to use this situation in Denver to try and ban guns in our state, to try and push anti-gun regulations on law-abiding gun owners. Well, that's going to do nothing. It's going to do nothing except make it easier for criminals to victimize people. That is the reality of it. That is what we're seeing in Denver and across our street. Gun control and gun laws make it easier for criminals to hurt good people. That is the truth. Anyways, let's move on. Last article of the week, CPR.org. Governor Polis' housing proposal would allow duplexes, townhomes, ADUs across many cities in Colorado. Now, of course, there's a housing crisis, but the government never lets a good crisis go to waste. Instead, they want to ram some sort of legislative solution that's not necessarily going to meet the needs of the community and might actually make problems worse. We saw that earlier, but let's take a look at what uh, Jared Polis is proposing. The Polis administration has laid out a sweeping plan that would explicitly allow more dense housing across Colorado's increasingly expensive metropolitan areas and resort communities. Even if residents and local elected officials object to it. Wow. So that's the biggest thing is that what they want to do, this is a power grab by the Polis administration. It's a significant shift in how Colorado cities and towns grow and who has the ultimate power to shape that growth. So basically Polis's idea is that the government should take control over the housing and zoning in these cities across the Colorado so that they can force, force dense housing in communities that do not want it. I mean, this is absolutely and utterly wrong. The end of single family only zoning in the state's largest cities, metro areas, and mountain resort communities could happen under the bill. Wow. This is Dominic Moreno, Iman Jode, and Stephen Woodrow. Woodrow is one of the most extreme, radical, anti-freedom, authoritarian legislators we have. So these tier one cities would see the biggest impact from the polls pr- proposal. So can you imagine if this bill passes, you're talking Denver, Colorado Springs, Aurora, Fort Collins, Lakewood, Greeley, Boulder, Grand Junction, Pueblo, Arvada, smaller cities where they'd be forced to put townhomes, multiplexes, <laughs> I mean, push those into communities, into suburban communities, just overwhelming them. I mean, this is a recipe for disaster. This needs to be rejected. And the housing that proposals we're seeing coming out of our state legislature are going to completely and utterly reshape Colorado into a dense, a dense situation that people do not want to live in. People move to the suburbs. They move out of these big uh, multiplexes because they want to have a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of freedom, maybe grow their own garden. Of course, Jared Polis wants to override what the local communities want and force this on Colorado. Don't let him do it. Well, anyways, thank you very much for joining me. This is Brandon from freestatecolorado.com with your weekly roundup for March 24th, 2023. You got any other news stories that you thought were interesting? Leave a reply on the website, send me an email, and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much, and have a great weekend.